that just got finished. Uh, anyways, that was great. Uh, fun, fun way to start. So I'm going to talk for the next 30 minutes or so. I'm Jason Harris from Mechanism. Uh, has anyone heard of Mechanism? <laughs> or an agency? A couple people, some people. Um, so I'm going to talk, kind of break this talk into three buckets. Talk a little bit about my background and how I got started in advertising. A little bit of the path of the company that we took. And then what we call um, Make Good and Make It Good, which is really started a couple years ago, which is part of the company that is about um, using our advertising powers, which all you guys have, for giving back and doing good things in the world, um, and how you get audiences involved when you do things like that. So I'm going to break it up into those three sections. So we're Mechanism. We're an independent agency. We're based in, we started in San Francisco, and we're based in San Francisco, New York, Chicago, Seattle. We're about 150 people. We work on big brands like Ben & Jerry's, Miller Coors, Charles Schwab, Virgin America, et cetera. And uh, this is me when I was about five. And I uh, was raised, my whole family is professors and teachers. They don't know what I do for a living. Uh, not teachers here that, that know what, what advertising is, but they're like uh, sociologists, anthropologists, and um, they're real academics. So they they were always reading in our house. You can see by my wife beater and shoes in the picture, they had four stripes. They didn't really get brands. I never had Adidas growing up. <laughs> never had cool products. I always had the $20 bin products. Um, and um, I sort of was a black sheep in the family. And about here, this is a, a profile of a TV addict. Um, you can tell by the way I'm dressed. But I really got into what everyone in my house was reading. I was always watching TV and watching movies and really into entertainment and storytelling. And I really found that those breaks in between uh, the TV shows, you guys don't watch linear TV, obviously, but back then, uh, those breaks in between the TV shows, there was no skip button. Uh, you had to watch them, and I found them fascinating and sort of always, always followed commercials as a young kid. And then, when I was about 12, I got turned on to this band, Kiss, and I don't know if you guys know this band. You've probably heard of them, but their music sucks. Uh, they totally blow, but when I got these albums as a kid, I learned about storytelling and mythology, and they created these characters, the Catman, the Spaceman, um, the Star Child, and they really took what was a very mediocre um, band and created a story around it, where these characters came from. You never saw them without their makeup. I would go to their concerts. I joined the Kiss Army. The Kiss Army was really the first influencer program of its kind where they would send handwritten letters to fans across the country, and they would have them call radio stations to get them to play their shitty music. And it really worked. And it, they're, I think, almost second to the Beatles in terms of album sales. Um, but it's really about the story that they created and the mythology that they created. And I didn't know it then, but subconsciously, I was really drawn to that. This is me, again, in a wife beater. I guess I like white beaters, but I went to James Madison in um, Harrisonburg, and I studied economics and finance, and I was really, uh, one, on one hand, really drawn into storytelling, but on the other hand, I had oppressive parents uh, that really wanted me to become a teacher or, or an academia, so um, that's what I studied. I wish I had gone to Brand Center, I wish I went to VCU and really learned the craft, but I had to learn it out on the whole cold, hard streets of, of the real working world. So after I got out of school, um, I decided, kind of quickly figured out storytelling, the ads that I watched as a kid, that could actually become a career. And so I started uh, work at a couple different agencies, Ligus Delaney, which is an agency in London, Ketchum, which I think is only PR now, I don't think they do advertising, and TBWA. So I kind of cut my teeth there and I had this real entrepreneurial spirit to start something. And so around 2001, I started a company called Plan C, with a terrible name, I mean, bad design. It was really not, not a great start. Uh, but I started this company with the concept that 
um, if if you could, what if you could flip the script? So if, if I was watching those ads in between shows, what if brands could do the shows, and then networks could sell ads on branded shows? So I actually, my first job, and I was really doing this on my own, is I had a, a concept to um, do a TV show around basketball players that go straight from high school into the NBA, and Adidas was really into basketball. I had Adidas by then, because um, I paid pay for it myself. Um, and I had this concept of doing a documentary around basketball players going from high school. Kevin Garnett was one of the first to do that, going from high school to the NBA. We profiled Dwight Howard and some others. And so what I did is I called, um, this, this is kind of the entrepreneurial spirit, I called Fox Sports and said, I have Adidas on the hook, and they're going to pay for me to produce an hour show, and you can run it for free on your network, and then sell the ad inventory and make money, and it won't cost you anything. I didn't have them on the hook. Then I called Adidas and said, I have Fox Sports willing to run this TV show. All you have to do is give me production money. And so uh, basically, I lied my way into my first project, and it worked out, and then I did that like four more times. Uh, and so I kind of like thought I had something. Then um, I was working by myself doing this, and then I met this guy who is our uh, executive creative director. His name's Tommy Means. Uh, in this picture, um, he's known as Buddy Waco, where every, summit, every year we have a company summit, and he gets up dressed like this and talks about the art of selling, the art of the pitch, and uh, he does it as a used car salesman, and it's really ridiculous and stupid, but he's my partner. Um, and the first project we worked on together is uh, we went to Disney, and Disney, um, have you guys heard of the Imagineers at Disney? So they create the rides, um, they're really the creative powerhouse behind the parks at Disney. And we pitched the head of the parks with this idea that we would create, we would bring the Imagineers to life through storytelling. And we created these characters that you see in the comic book. And uh, we went in there and said, we're going to you know, sell the Imagineers to the, to the public, and it's going to be a whole new revenue stream. And we went to China and made these little characters and brought them to the pitch. We spent a gazillion dollars on it. And uh, this was the first time with my partner, Tommy, that we were pitching. And the head of the parks loved the idea. It was, it was sold. And we were like off to the races. This was kind of the, a big turning point um, for mechanism. And, uh, at the end of the meeting, uh, the big guy from the parks who had like a trail of people taking notes, you know, behind him and assistance, uh, he was walking out and at the end of the meeting he said, there's just one thing, I don't like the characters you designed, we would want to design the characters because we're Disney. And my partner, Tommy, uh, this guy said, no way, these are the, what the characters look like. So he's telling a guy at Disney that he can design better characters and then we never heard from him again. And that was it. And so that's when I realized that, you know, instead of working on my own, working with, he needed me and I needed him because he had great ideas. It's really, you know, about this picture. You need, you need when you start something, you need people with complementary skill sets because he was an idiot and couldn't close a deal, but he had great ideas and I was good at closing the deal, but he was better at the idea part. So uh, this picture kind of represents that. So that's my story, and then we start, Mechanism's been going on for about 12 years. I'm going to take you through a few uh, pieces of work that sort of, sort of show how advertising has changed a little bit over time. Um, the first big thing that we did was, this was, uh, you guys would never know this, but when there were really viral campaigns that were very easy to do back in the day because there was so little content online. And if you had something funny, whether it was from a brand or someone filming their friend, it would gain traction because there was a, a desert of content out there, which is obviously flipped. Uh, and so this was the first big break that we had because we lost the Disney thing. I had been caught lying about you know doing the Adidas work and all that stuff. And so we kind of needed a hit because you know, you're know you only as good as your, your latest hit. And so this was our first big hit and it was for a video game called Sega Monkey Ball. And the concept was, when we just did a video where we really didn't show game footage, but we just put an actual guy in a ball on a college campus. And so uh, that's this video. <coughs> Nintendo 
shot is about the same quality as the monster movie. Uh, no, no effects for the monster movie. Uh, but it did, uh, it did pretty well. And then, um, we get surprisingly, and then we got another big break. If you guys um, know the history of uh, how the music industry changed, Napster um, changed it all with free music. And they were trying to launch a paid service which ultimately didn't work, but we got to launch it. So this was our kind of next big viral hit, which was relaunching Napster. So I'll show you uh, some quick pieces on that. That was Napster. And then um, in about 2010, so we were kind of known as this viral digital um, upstart. And then fast forward, we started, um, we became really like an agency of record where we took on big clients. And um, we had another big break with um, Apes Will Rise Again, which was a Fox uh, movie. And we did this video. So the way, you know, viral. Uh, videos took off again, you know, with a Sega monkey ball it was shot poorly Funny idea did really well Napster clever simple did really well then fast forward to like 2011 more modern 
times, you really had to do something that would stand out to gain traction. So that's where the idea of like, is it real, is it fake, um, came in. And this was one of the first ones that did that. Uh, and it's about an ape shooting a gun. Can apes really shoot guns? And the, prem the insight was, if apes are getting smarter, what, can, what are they capable of? Century Fox library research footage, and this got picked up all over the world, and people really thought that apes could shoot guns, but they can't shoot guns. <laughs> and there's like a thumb thing there. All right, um, and then I just have a couple other quick uh, things to show you. Then we sort of became more of um, the big full service type agency where we started doing global campaigns, anthemic campaigns, and that's kind of where we are today. Um, so we started as a sort of um, Indie Upstart doing a lot of viral pieces. And then this is a, a recent piece that we did uh, a few years ago for North Face. Sorry about that. All right, so anyway, those are some pieces, uh, the evolution of the company, and now I'm going to talk about um, the main thread, which is um, make it good or using your superpowers for good, which is really a lot of what the company is taking on now. So we have a lot of big clients, we're, we're an agency. Um, but we also are independent and we, we feel like we want to be doing more than just um, advertising. And so, you know, being a madman uh, today, people still think, you know, because of that TV show that this is what we do, um, which is sort of true, uh, but not entirely. Uh, there was a Gallup poll that came out last year that said in terms of um, professions with the worst ethics, um, there was congressman, and then right underneath congressman was advertising practitioner, and then right below that was used car salesman. And so there's a perception out there that what we do is it doesn't have a lot of scruples in terms of advertising. And we sell products to people that they might not need. Um, and, and there's another uh, Harvard Business School study that came out that said, 5% of millennials think that brands make a noticeable contribution to their lives. So with that in mind, you know, the, the industry today has really changed and brands really have to think about not just selling product, but what's their promise and what do they stand for and what are their value, what's their value system uh, in order to, you know, turn the tide from where we are in terms of, of ethics and what people think we do for a living. So the truth is, though, that 
while people might, you know, you might, when you're trying to watch your YouTube video and you can't wait to skip the ad that you're, you're, that's blocking you, or if you're streaming content and you pay to ignore the ads, or you're on Spotify and you don't want ads, people do hate ads, but people do love a good story. Everyone loves a good story. And if you can mirror telling a brand story and entertain the audience, while selling your product or service, then you've got uh, a big hit. If you think about a sneaker, um, regular sneaker, you know, you know, I had cheap ones. Um, but if you think about a regular sneaker, this is kind of a layup example. But you think of what what Nike did through the power of of what they stand for. That if you have a body, you're an athlete, and they live that promise, and they stand for that promise, and they've done that for decades. And so they've really developed a powerful, powerful pop culture. Uh, brand, or if you think of so, uh, sugar water, which we've done work on, which you're basically you know selling sugar water to kids, but that brand can really have defining pop cultural moments, like what happened this week. Uh, it can have bad <laughs> ramifications when you get those pop culture moments wrong. If they had gotten it right, their brand equity score would be super high. If they got it wrong, and it kind of starts to erase a lot of what they built up with their brand story. Um, you think about selling deodorant, which just makes you not smell. Um, you can think about a brand like Dove with the insight that uh, every woman is beautiful. And it, they did a whole campaign about real beauty. And they went from a bar of soap you know, 12 years ago to, to you know, multi, multi-billion dollar business. So there's power in advertising. So we asked ourselves as a company, what if we could use our powers for good and do something beyond selling sugar water and sneakers? Although we do like selling sugar water and sneakers. Don't get me wrong. What would be possible? And so this is a, a quote that sort of started our involvement marketing practice and approach, which is a Chinese proverb. Uh, Tell me and I'll forget. Show me and I might remember. But if you involve me, I'll really understand what you stand for. So involvement marketing, we really break it down into sort of three real simple ideas. And that's simplifying something that's really complex, finding what the truth is, inspiring the audience with some launch campaign or some idea, and then figure out how you pull in your audience to get involved in the campaign. And so as you guys you know, move forward in, in, in advertising and marketing, really today it's about the power of the audience marketing with the brand and not the not just the message put it, being put out there. So this is a campaign that we launched in 2014 before the orange guy was in office and we had this guy who was much cooler um, in office and uh, he really came to us with this concept that which was very complicated. The, the concept was uh, and I had had a friend uh, in college that was raped, so it was a very near and dear subject to me. And the idea was that on college campus, sexual assault is more prevalent than ever. Uh, one in five women, 20%, typically freshmen and sophomores, have some type of sexual assault happen to them. And so they kind of, Obama kind of laid this problem at our feet and said, we really need a, an agency to help us uh, stem the tide and tackle this, this issue. Uh, but of course they have no money, and so it's a pro bono uh, project. I think this was uh, Plato that said, mother is, is the nece or necessity is the mother of invention. And the idea was, if we, this is where the involvement practice started, if we don't have any money, we have a very complicated issue like sexual assault, what could we do? Like, coming out with a campaign saying, don't rape people, is probably not going to be really effective. And so the insight was, if 3% of people are committing this crime, what if we talk to the 96% that could actually do something about it, and we made it their problem? Not the problem for the, the people that are doing it, the small minority. What if we made it everybody's problem? And so that's really where simplifying a very complex issue into the basics, which is it's on us, that's where the, the idea came from. And then we launched this um, launch spot uh, to kick it off. It's on us to stop sexual assault. To get in the way before it happens. To get a friend home safe. To not blame the victim. It's on us 
to look out for each other. To not look, look the other way. It's on us to stand up. To step in. To take responsibility. It's on us, all of us, to stop sexual, sexual assault. assault. Learn how and take the pledge at itsonus.org. Was that? Oh, it's this one. No. See, I should have. I should have tried to do that. Uh, so, anyways, this that was a campaign. So, the the simplify um, idea is coming up with a very simple message, inspiring the audience by launching it. We had the fortunate ability to get celebrities uh, and launch it that way. Uh, and then Lady Gaga did a song. It was it was on the Grammys. Uh, we got a lot of companies involved, but then the involvement piece came on to, you know, if you just did awareness campaign, it wasn't really going to make a dent in the problem. So what we did is we created a site with that um, simple um, spot that you saw, and we wrote how to shoot it, uh, the script, and we gave it to colleges and universities to create their own. And we got over 438 student PSAs created. We also had toolkits about how to hold rallies on college campuses. This is a good one because it's the army where the, the problem is prevalent. We designed t-shirts that people could order online. So we created the basic tools to spread the campaign instead of just launching the campaign and stopping or just coming up with a, with a line. And it's been very successful. Um, let's see by the chart, it's successful. Uh, and then we just launched this um, uh, last week. This was a new part of the campaign, uh, and it's called Autocorrect. Don't ignore the subtext. It's on us to intervene in sexual assault. Because we can. Take the pledge at itsonus.org. And then uh, our friend Joe tweeted it out, and then it got on the homepage of Reddit, and it was, uh, it's been successful. So again, simplify, inspire, involve. That's how we approach involvement marketing. I'll show one more example. Uh, this is a campaign for the United Nations. Have you guys heard of the Sustainable Development Goals at all? Show of hands. Okay, about 30 or so. Uh, so the Sustainable Development Goals, 193 countries every 15 years get together, and they agree on the problems together that these countries are going to try to solve for the world. So it's a really special thing, but it takes place with prime ministers and presidents in sort of back rooms, and they think they congratulate themselves for coming up with them, but the world doesn't really know about them. I mean, everyone in this room should know about these things. This is basically like gender equality, ending poverty, climate change, life below water, all of these issues that affect us and our children, but no one really knows about these sustainable development goals. So there's 17 of them, which is super complicated, no one can remember that. Sustainable development goals doesn't really roll off the tongue. So, you know, what's a small agency that cares about the world going to do about it? So we're trying to create, we just launched this, we're trying to create action around a global initiative. So our, again, following the principles, simplify, inspire, involve. The way we came up with a, a concept around this was from this photo, it all starts with a good story. So this photo is from Apollo 8. William Anders took this in 1968. It's called Earth Rise. It's one of the most famous, it's called the most famous environmental photo of our time. And it was the first time where the world could, could see the world, the globe, uh, as one without borders, um, no divisions. And so we looked at, took, took this photo as inspiration and sort of came up with this idea that the task of bettering our world is bigger than any one of us, but it's smaller than all of us together, seven billion people on the planet. And so through simplifying, we came up with a simple handle of one for all based on that photo. And one for all breaks these 17 complex, huge issues that are daunting and we're never gonna solve poverty. 
we're never going to fix climate change. But it breaks it into one for all, which is the, the simple idea is everyone did one thing. That's it. They picked one thing they cared about, did one thing. That's seven billion things happening to make the world better. I know it sounds really lofty and crazy, but imagine if it could happen. And so uh, this is the um, last piece creative I'll show you. But this launched at the UN. And so again, simple idea, 193 countries, super complex, 17 goals, one for all, boils it all down into the simplest language. And then this is the Inspire piece, which is to launch it uh, with a piece of content. Seven billion people on Earth, 193 nation states of the UN, 17 sustainable development goals to address poverty, injustice, and climate change. But the only number you need to remember is one. Together, we're one for all. The task of bettering our world is bigger than any one of us, but it's smaller than all of us. Find your one for all and take the pledge at oneforall.org. We're really into pledges. Um, and so this campaign is just launching. Uh, we're, we're trying to, we're really, to be frank, we're trying to figure out the involvement piece and how to uh, involve the audience around the planet. Um, with this project, because we just kind of started it and kicked it off. So again, uh, involvement marketing, simplify, inspire, and involve. And the impact that this has had, at least on our company, um, doing involvement marketing campaigns, it's only 10% of our company that we focus on, but it's really increased morale in the company. People realize that we have a purpose and we're doing something more than just, you know, selling HBO shows and Peloton bikes and stuff like that. No, that's all good. This is a live stream. I love your brands. Um, and we're, we're about more than money. And the, com the company can really come together through shared beliefs and a value system. And the idea that advertising, you know, we want that Gallup poll to have advertising, you know, ranked really high with like professors and people that are doing good things in the world. Um, and that's sort of our, our task. And so um, Make Good is an initiative that we're doing. And so um, the other thing that came out of this uh, is we started something called the Creative Alliance. And the Creative Alliance is a group of 50 companies that, because we did that It's On Us campaign, and um, I, Heidi, Heidi Hackermeyer, who spoke here recently, we started this um, program called the Creative Alliance, and the idea is, you know, we're, we're a small firm, she has a small firm, we're doing this UN campaign, we did that White House campaign, but what if other agencies, you know, branded together for good and could go out there and really make a, make a dent in the world with all kinds of issues? So we started this, and it was actually really easy to recruit companies uh, to use their powers for good. And these are all the companies so far. We started last year. There's 50 companies involved. It's uh, very challenging to manage. Um, but we have a full-time person who's working with all the companies on different programs. And they work with a nonprofit in D.C. called Civic Nation. And we've done, uh, so far, 13 campaigns that have been pretty effective. So uh, in conclusion here, I told you a little bit about my background, how Mechanism got started. And then this new approach that we have, which is make, make good and involvement marketing. And I think as you guys um, continue your careers and go out there in the advertising space, let's try to change the notion of what we do for a living and really think about how can you make an impact and create involvement marketing for the, the work that you guys do. And if you go into client side or agency side, how do you do that? And you know, step one is find something that you, I cared about sexual assault. Find something that you really care about, because if you're not passionate about that, the, the involvement marketing program is never going to work. Look at other people, your friends. You know, back to that story I told you about Tommy being a wild man. You really need partners in whatever you do. You need to collaborate in order to make a dent and, and really have the stamina to keep going, both in, in advertising uh, and in involvement marketing programs. So find people in your circle. Uh, it could be making a monster movie about corn uh, and how corn has to, you know, 
sustainability issues. I don't know what it is, but find that group. These guys found a group that they worked on something with. Find a, find a group that is committed to the same things you guys are committed to and, and then launch it. And then figure out what your goal is, what impact you want to have, uh, what's going to be a measurement of success, and then work backwards from there. So I just encourage you to think about as you, you know, continue your careers, even if you can even start it on, on school here, but as you continue your careers, let's try to think about advertising because we have real, real power. The you know, words and images are very, very powerful and, and you know, they make a huge impact. So let's try to sell all the products we can and at the same time, let's try to make the world a little bit better as well. Uh, so thanks for the time, I appreciate it. Oh, the Pepsi? Yeah. Uh, what's that? Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, are we in a are we in a uh, confidential room? Yes, we are. Uh, like, now we are. All right, cool. Um, I think um, <laughs> agencies are very happy about it because they did it in house. I mean, we were one of the, their agencies that we worked with them for years. And I think the idea that clients can do their own work without an outside perspective. If there's an agency involved, that never would have seen the light of day. Um, but I think brands can often get very uh, into their own uh, world and think that their brand might have more power um, or message than it does. And so I think the impact, in my opinion, is a lot of brands will really consider that agencies are very beneficial. And that outside perspective that's in touch with the audience um, is critical. So, but I'm biased because I have an agency. But I think that's going to be the impact. I don't think there's going to be like a long-term impact on the brand. There may be a long-term impact on the actual group, though. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's, that's It's true. kind of sad because yeah. Brad Baker is Okay. Yeah, Brad's great guy. Got the right, the right instincts. Yeah. Know, it's a, I think if it came out of that Kendall to save the world, it might. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe. There's something unreal about that. Okay, exactly. now a real question, please. Anyone else? Yes. Um, you had uh, all the brands up there that you're working with. Yeah. Um, you had Black Sheep and Sub Rosa. Yeah. Are those the Black Sheep and Sub Rosas of Richmond, or? Um, no, they're uh, in New York. Is there a Sub Rosa in Richmond? Yeah, and a Black Sheep. Really? But they're restaurants and bakery. Oh, they are? Oh, no. Those are advertising agencies. But, you know, they want to donate food. That, would, that always helps. Uh, any other questions? Yes. So you're pretty much in charge of what you do since you're the CEO of Mechanism. Mm -hmm. That is a great question. Um, well, I mean, I would just say it. it's like if you're working at a company and you want to start something, I mean, I think you should go to whoever is in charge, tell them what you want to do. If they don't want to do it, then you should do it outside the company. And I think you'd be surprised when you get a group of people together, um, how you get people to donate time and energy and resources. And I wouldn't let a company hold you back if you have something that you want to do. You can still work at that company, but you can kind of do it on the side. But I'd go to whoever's in charge and, and ask them uh, if they want to, you know, you've got to have an idea first, but once you have an idea, I'd go to whoever's in charge. Can I add to that? Yes. Uh, oh, this is Amanda Spear. She, if you want a job, talk to her. Her, her phone number. <laughs> um, so a little bit about my personal history. My husband's actually in law enforcement, which is a very polarizing subject right now in the world. And so 
but it's also a topic that's very passionate to me and I found by reaching out to foundations that I'm really involved or excited about I have a specialty that they lack internally whether it's you know your ability to comp I mean wounded warrior project does not have art directors on staff and so my ability to just reach out to them directly and use my powers and connections to help them and the, what they're going after and what they're trying to accomplish, sometimes it's starting there and then bringing it up. Um, or you know, then you have that connection to bring to your agency or whatever because you're already involved at a granular level. Yeah. And I think in companies, you know, like um, we have a CFO and I have partners. And I think you need to, you know, we say 10% of our resources are donated to this, so you kind of have to put some framework and structure around it, or people think you're like, you know, trying to drive the company into the ground, I think. Yes? Um, do you find that any conflict arises when you're thinking about new clients, and then perhaps knowing that there are certain things about that brand or company that may not align with your values of wanting to do good for the community, especially like we're talking about sugar water and certain things that we all know inherently aren't good for us or for yeah. people, especially talking about the sustainable goals. Yeah. Would you say that if a company came forward and you, you knew that they were just simply making their products in foreign countries, you know, slave labor or whatever, um, would that be something that you think about when thinking about doing work for them? I mean, that, that's a, an awesome question, and we've been faced with that um, countless times. I think if you look closely at any big corporation, you're going to find a lot of things, um, and then you're going to have no clients. There's always something, right? Um, that being said, we've turned down pitches because some company values, um, like there was a company that was um, anti-gay and you know was very public about it. We decided, you know, not to go after that business for that reason. Um, but you know, we run a business, and you know, you 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 can't you can't look too you don't want to look too hard at that. And on the flip side. You can also um, work with them to donate money to causes that might align with them. But I think the good news is today, companies, uh, you know, because of you guys, companies have to be purpose driven. They have to have values that they stand for. They have to do something, uh, po have a positive impact, or, uh, and they know that. You know, everyone's scrambling to figure out what they're, um, a lot of like Unilever's trying to get really heavily involved with the sustainable development goals. Um, so I think the tides kind of turned where companies are um, seeing that as a as a way to build brand equity. Did I answer your question? Yeah. No? Okay. Yes. Uh, so it's a cliche, but the uh, media landscape is uh, changing uh, more than ever, and you know, with that sort of media buys and you know the way that we see advertising, uh, a lot of people hate advertising. They think it's the worst thing ever. I think yeah. most people in this room use ad block or subscribe to Netflix, which uh, has a very anti-advertising uh, perspective. Yeah. Like, as you're, you're, you're pretty much on the front lines of this, I'm wondering like, how you deal with it in that sense. So, what what's the future of our industry? Yeah. No, basically, <laughs> uh, uh, well, my, my new book's coming out. Uh, no, I don't know. Um, I mean, I think, um, I, w I would just say that the, there's always, you know, if you make great content, which is really hard to do, and you entertain the audience, uh, people will share your stuff no matter what. And so I think the, the jo our jobs have gotten a lot harder, but our jobs are still critical. I mean, cre good creative ideas will always be an endangered species and brands will always need them, no matter what. Whether there's you know, ad blockers. When DVR first came out, everyone said there was never gonna be TV ads anymore. Um, and there's, there still are. Uh, so, um, I don't know, I feel like, in a way, our industry has never been healthier because there's so much, there's so many platforms out there and those platforms need to work with brands because they have to make money and brands are still the source of money. I mean, advertising is still the backbone of a lot of the economy. So, I didn't really answer your question, but I think... That was a very good question. Yeah. It's kind of all over the place. Yeah. Well, that was a great question, <laughs> but um, I think it's, we just always have to figure out ways to insert brands where people are.
and it's getting harder, but uh, and on, on the other hand, it's get, it's, there's a lot more options and opportunities. Yes. Me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kristen, second year strategist. I had a question just about the culture and personality of the company. How do you balance your cynical, silly past with the serious, more, yeah, like serious present and going into the future? Like, how do you balance that? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> how do we do that, Amanda? I don't know. I guess more so, I mean, like, what is the plan for the future? Knowing this was your past, it was more silly, cynical, and your present is a lot more serious, taking on these clients. Like, yeah, I mean, I still like, think we're rooted in, a lot of it's just maturity, like, we're, we're maturing as a company and as people, but we still have a lot of fun and don't take ourselves too seriously. We have a book when everyone starts that has like our guiding principles um, in it and we really try to stick to those, which is you know about um, ego, being egoless and no politics and there's things like that. Um, but we still have you know 20% jackass in there, I would say. I say it I used to be like 80% jackass and I was like 20%. I think too, I mean, it's just like a natural progression. I mean, like when I visit my grandma, I don't use the word fuck like the word um, but when I'm with my friends, I kind of do. And so, you know, you kind of turn it on and off just like as an agency. So yeah. you have to be capable of both because not, it's silly is not going to work for every brand. Just like, you know, really impactful work isn't going to work for super monkey ball. Yeah. She said it better. <laughs> Any other questions? We do have um, a bonus thing we wanted to show you that just launched today, if I may. Is that all right? Yeah. All right. Uh, we just did, um, this just came out today. We did a brand campaign for HBO. And I just wanted to show this to you because we thought it was pretty funny. Um, so this is fresh off the presses. You're the, one of the first people to ever see this. If it works. Are we on Wi-Fi? We are on Wi-Fi. Hold, please. Suspense is killing you. Yeah. You feel it. Maybe it's just low. This one's right here. Okay, the volume is still on. What is the point of this whole concept? Nobody tunes into HBO for the static. <laughs> that is not a beloved sound. No one says, oh yeah, HBO. You know, that one that does that. <laughs> You managed to get the, the entire Game of Thrones cast. Uh, 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 hold on. Uh, <laughs> hey, Jamie Lannister, make a noise with your mouth. Uh, Dance for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's impressive if it isn't some form of corporate bullying, by which I mean, ah. Uh, 